And uh, there we go. So thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the ceded, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and we thank you very much for, for that, even though we are meeting virtually. Uh, Mary, thank you very much. Mary is our um, MLA, of course, for Langley and um, has been for quite some time. And right now you're in the seat of the opposition during a pandemic versus the leadership opportunities. But you yourself have been ministers of environment. I'm going to I'm going to stop there because that's the last one I can remember. And I know there's several others and your titles are um, and, and your experience that you bring to the job is immense. And so thank you for joining us today and sort of giving us some insight from you on what we do next, what as a community, um, um, of course, as a chamber, as a business lens. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm sorry, I am Colleen Clark. I'm the CEO of the Langley Chamber of Commerce. Um, so Mary, I maybe want to give a bit of an opening as to what you've been up to for the past month oh. while it's sort of been going on. Uh, lots and lots and lots of conference calls. Um, that minimizes uh, it really. I mean, the, the reality for people, um, as you well know, is that they are being impacted pretty severely. Uh, so many people who do not have uh, a paycheck coming in, or if they're a business, they don't have the revenue coming in. And uh, nobody anticipates something like this happening just all of a sudden, right? You, you prepare for things that you think are going to happen more on a, a slow motion basis. You don't, you don't prepare for this. So a lot of um, trying to direct constituents to the right sources of help, you know, whether that's federal, provincial, sometimes local, um, trying to sort things out for individuals, businesses, um, also uh, maintaining a conduit to government. So um, our health critic, Norm Letnick, has been working very directly with Adrian Dix, the health minister on uh, the health file. And then when it comes to all the non-health related things around COVID-19, and it is astonishing uh, how many things are impacted, uh, that falls to me as house leader to work together with Mike Farnworth, um, who's uh, their house leader on their side. And he's been quarterbacking uh, and his office have been quarterbacking, taking those non-health um, issues uh, from me and then over uh, into whatever ministry is related to the file. So um, really a, a lot of just uh, trying to help people out and trying to help them find their way. Yeah, I find, um, I always have always said that the chamber is a conduit and now that's come forward. Than ever. So than ever, yeah. The information is is constant. It's feeding the information and getting it out there and trying to help where you can and, and a lot of listening to, to what's going on because half of the battle is somebody just wants somebody to hear what, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and and you you can you can easily um, you can easily underestimate the uh, personal, psychological, emotional toll that it takes on people because the the financial toll or the health toll is is so apparent. Um, but these are these are people struggling with something um, that they've never anticipated, and in the midst of that, if they have kids, um, they're dealing with kids at home, and if they have an elderly. Uh, parent or family member, uh, you know, they're dealing with their issues, um, you know, so you pile it all on and uh, that makes for a pretty tough go for people. Um, I apologize for any background noise you hear. It's a cat named Luna um, <laughs> who knows how to open the door to this room, so I'm not even bothering to close it, uh, but she may run in and out and attack things and hopefully won't attack me. We'll just see. We had a staff meeting the other day and one of the girls was using earphones and the microphone and her cat came out of the photo and dove on the microphone at some point in the call. It was one of the better Zoom calls we've had. Um, so I may have dog pitter patter through the room too. I do apologize. Um, but so when it comes to the business end of it, all of the different programs, of course, have rolled out and the majority of them are federal. So, yeah. I mean, again, I, we were talking at the municipal level the other day and trying to focus down what exactly is what can municipalities do at this time yeah. when things are on fire, let's be honest. Um, and, and so with the, the same with the province. So one of the things that comes up under provincial domain is the rent and the mm -hmm. rental assistance. Mm -hmm. So personally, um, there's been some, you know, there's been the move forward and there is, um, let me just admit some people, pardon me. Um, there is the opportunity there for people to, you know, get some help on the personal side and sort of individuals have been helped very quickly. Businesses yeah. have been a bit slower to roll out. May 1st is on Friday. Um, 
have you heard, we have from our side of it, from the chamber side, from almost every different sector, that the problem with the current rent agreement is the landlords need to buy in. Yeah. And, and you have, and, yeah. Right. Uh, you, you have a number of you have number of landlords. Um, we're hearing this uh, all over, but particularly in smaller communities. Um, I don't know if statistically it happens more in smaller communities, but where um, if a landlord uh, has owned a building for years and years and years and they don't have a mortgage, right? Um, very often, unfortunately, um, those landlords are not interested in participating because they don't feel they need relief on their mortgage. So therefore, they're just saying no, pay up. Um, yeah that makes it a I mean, great difficulty yeah. for the business. And I don't, I, I mean, we, we want to be careful not to lay this at, at the feet of landlords. It's not like landlords no, not at all. should bear a disproportionate um, part of the burden here. Everybody's in this together. Um, but the fact that it depends on landlords to participate makes it a great, great problem um, for small businesses um, who are left with, uh, what do they do then? Um, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, I interrupted you there. I'm sorry. You probably no, no. It's fine. I was going to say, are are do would you, as uh, the opposition party, have any ideas on tweaks or things like uh, personally as a chamber organization from most of the province in a discussion with a lot of CEOs, it would have been better if the money was put to the renters to pay it and the onus on them versus the landlords. Yeah. I mean. You know, I won't, I won't get into the, the federal government's going to do what the federal government's going to do. This I, is I think, provincial. Yeah, but, but yeah. so, oh, you, yeah, you, you mean not the commercial rents, but the individual ones. Well, the commercial rents still, yeah. that, that, I mean, the money's coming from the feds, but it's actual provincial jurisdiction. Uh, yeah, technically, although they don't really have a part in design in this one, like they, they would yeah. tell you that too. Um, here's though, I, I think we really haven't seen the province enter into this part of the stage yet. Uh, I say yet because I'm hopeful they will. Um, we heard the premier uh, yesterday, I guess, saying that they're going to have their plan um, for recovery and getting out of this um, announced on Tuesday. And so I guess we can hope that there's maybe some something additional coming from the province to date. Um, and you see this in, in the numbers to date, it's been more uh, the province waiting to see if the feds will carry the ball instead of them. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are quite staggering. I mean, as a, as a percent of GDP, which is arguably an equivalent measure to compare, um, the feds have put up in their total of all their packages about 10% of GDP, which is not as big as some countries have, but it's, it's still a pretty large, pretty significant amount. Um, and in contrast, um, the assistance that the province has provided all told only amounts to just around 2% of GDP. So um, there's still, you know, a fair bit of room that the province has to move and yet they've chosen to sort of wait and see uh, what the feds do. And I don't think, you know, when you listen to the prime minister, um, talk about the various programs they have. I don't, I don't think any of them are intended to be uh, sort of 100% uh, of the support. They're intended to be a bit of a backstop to what provinces might ordinarily be doing. So we really haven't seen uh, what the province might do. Um, almost all the programs, though, I, I think if I had a criticism of them in, in a general sense, it's that uh, they tend to uh, focus on the front end rather than thinking about how you make the mechanism work so there aren't unintended consequences that, that bubble up along the way, right? Uh, we're hearing from businesses, for example, um, who are having trouble recruiting uh, people um, at, at the lower end of the wage scale because um, they can apply for the CERB and they'd rather just apply for the CERB than and yeah. get their 2000 a month. But, you know, so uh, one agricultural producer that I uh, spoke to had put an ad out uh, for workers, $15 an hour, uh, two weeks later had two applicants. You know, so. One of the things we've been hearing as well as um, that is people that have been laid off from positions. And then with the wage subsidy coming in, people have tried to bring them back and they've said, you know what, I'm gonna make more I'll money just, sitting at yeah, home. And I'll then just that take becomes, the Yep. that then becomes a labor relations issue yep. because uh, technically by refusing to come back from layoff, you're quitting. Yeah. So that's, that's been a bit of an issue as well for some people. So. Yeah. And that's, and that's where this, you know, if, if these things aren't well thought out, I understand the urgency with trying to get money out, but it's not like we've seen success on that scale, right? The applications that have gone in 
provincially anyway, uh, federally has been a little bit faster, but, but provincially has taken forever for people to be able to apply. Um, and then I understand, you know, people on the phone waiting quite a long time uh, to get any additional help if they have a bit of a, an anomaly in their process. So, um, you know, we'll, I'm, I'm sure as we get past the health aspect of this, uh, the appetite for critiquing what's gone on in terms of support and then ultimately in terms of recovery is going to come. Uh, there hasn't been much yet. The media attention has been largely on the health piece. And by all means, I mean, nobody has a plan. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Right. And, and, and right. I've said it even, I mean, I've, I've said it as I've, I've jokingly said, Mary, a lot of times that I've had more coffee and conversations with the prime minister lately than anybody else. Because <laughs> I'm there with my cup of coffee at 8 a.m. waiting for him to come out of the cottage, right? Um, <laughs> and, and yep, Jeanette has a great question. What is a plan for small businesses that don't qualify for help for what the government is offering? So Jeanette, the hardest part with that is, is, is most of the programs have been laid out to try and fill the gaps when there's a gap found. Yeah. Sort of, I think what that's what we're saying, Mary, is like the, the, the play is being played, but we're making it up as we go along. Yeah, there doesn't, seem to, there doesn't seem to be a lot of forward planning. I, I guess that's where, I, you know, and I, it would be natural because my focus is naturally provincial, uh, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, do we really expect that, um, you know, the federal government and the level at which they operate, understanding in Canada, the division between, you know, federal and provincial, do we really think, expect that the feds would have a great understanding of the nuts and bolts of what's happening in communities with small business? I mean, I really think that's, that's more a place for the province to operate. And, you know, thus far, uh, we haven't seen that. Maybe that's something that'll come on Tuesday. I know they've been hearing a lot about it. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not, so far, I don't see action that's addressing the realities on the ground, which is, uh, you know, May 1st, you're, you're a commercial tenant, uh, you've had no revenue for the last at least one month, um, and, you know, you, you, what are you doing? Are you declaring bankruptcy tomorrow? You know, if your landlord's not cooperating, you've got bills to pay, hydro doesn't help you unless you're shut, I mean, uh, you know. Uh, this is this is not is there a plan right now there there doesn't really appear to be right now which is a sad commentary but um you know that's that's the frightening piece is you know is this going to become uh more of a recovery operation than a rescue one and and you know we need to see that rescue coming uh pretty darn quick if it's going to be of any help um, we participated with our members in both of the last two BC Chamber surveys and, well, and the big one that came out, the first one, plus the Canadian Chamber just released the numbers yesterday um, from 13,000 businesses working with Stats Canada. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's grim. Yeah, that's very it's grim. Very, very grim. And right now, sort of what business is trying to say, I think, to government on every level is we've got a 60 to 90 day window for a big portion of business, about 45% of them that said they were really struggling right now. But... That, but after that, that 60 to 90 day window, if things, if help arrives, things happen, or we lighten up and revenues can flow a bit, they'll be okay and they can do this. Yeah. But after that 90 day, there's a lot of people thinking that light, the end of the tunnel might be shut off for a while. Or yeah. clarity from, uh, from Bonnie Henry, from government will help. Yes. Um, she, she went a little bit that direction, uh, yesterday on the briefing, yeah. you know, pointing out to people that there's a whole lot of, in fact, most businesses have not been officially closed, uh, by her. There's only a small, uh, small, per small number or small segment of the small business population have actually been, uh, ordered to shut. Um, so, uh, that, you know, that begins to open the door for, okay, uh, design some safe operations, um, you know, in your business. The reality, though, and I know small business owners know this, is um, are people going to come back? When will they come back? And for all that people complain about being stuck in their home and they'd like to go out and do their favorite things, um, there's, you know, you talk to people, there's a reticence about getting out there. And um, if you're a retailer, for example, you've got to, you know, roll the dice and say, okay, well, I'm going to open up and, uh, uh, you know, put in place all the measures I need to be safe. But uh, what if I do that and pay my staff or call my staff in and I don't get people in shopping? Yeah. So, is. you know, there, there is, this is not, May is going to be a very unpleasant and uncomfortable month and it is going to be really challenging. 
And the uh, yeah, I think part of the problem, not problem, but part of the, the aspect that people aren't realizing is every sector is different yeah. on what's going to be required, how they're going to be able to operate. Different types of retail are going to be different. Um, restaurants, bars, and pub clubs or casinos are all going to have completely different ways of looking yeah. at things. Um, you know, uh, tourism. <laughs> yeah. Tourism. It, it, it's encouraging though. I mean, to that, to that end, I, I mean, I had some friends of mine when, when Bonnie Henry was saying, well, uh, uh, in answer to some questions, you know, come to me with a proposal, tell me what you think. And I had some friends of mine react saying, oh, she should, she should give, you know, absolute explicit direction. I said, well, hold on. Think about that for a minute because she's a great medical health officer, but um, she doesn't know anything about hockey or about running a restaurant or a bar. Um, you don't want her making those rules. You actually want her um, taking a look at what the industry itself wants to do, what the sector proposes, and then you know giving them some guidelines based on that. You don't want her telling you exactly what to do. So I, I think we can, we can be glad she seems to be taking the approach that she wants uh, the specific yeah. sectors to be the ones to decide how they deal with the guidelines she's given. But, you know, ultimately it's going to, it's going to come down to, do we get, do we get the people back shopping? I mean, um, it's a, it's a, there's a knock on effect of every one of these things, because as a business goes under, the employees don't have money in turn, they're not shopping round and round you go. And then of course there's looming um, discussion around increased supports uh, for workers, which sounds wonderful, um, but you're faced with who's going to pay for it. Um, cost if, factor is my next. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're going to expand things like uh, sick leave, paid sick leave, um, in theory, that sounds wonderful. Um, but for a small business, depending on, you know, your revenue stream and the number of employees, um, it could be absolutely unaffordable. So on the one hand, you want to help the employee, but of course, if you get to a place where it's unaffordable for the business, um, the employee's not doing any better if the business goes bankrupt. Exactly. So at some point, you've got to wrestle with who pays for all this. And it, you know, certainly it's not something, I don't think it's something that, that government would see as a price tag that it could afford across the piece. So uh, we certainly don't want to see small businesses tagged with additional costs at a time when they can barely afford to keep the lights on. And that's going to end not just the cost, but some of the stuff that will be required yeah. is in short supply. Yeah. So the PPE, I mean, if you're opening up sectors, so for instance, if you look like beauty council, um, yeah. you know, if you, if they're, they're doing a cross of all of their members, the, their office is across the hall from mine. Um, yeah. So they're, they're checking out to find out what their members are going to need moving forward, trying to, trying to figure that out because until they're told what they're going to be allowed to do, they can't figure out what the need and yep. cost is going to be. So uh, yeah, that's, that becomes the really hard part. And, and again, time is of the essence, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, know? that's the thing. If you take a couple of weeks to figure this out, well, then what are you mid-May? And they've already been suffering since, you know, end of March. I mean, goodness. I mean, on the light side and high, bright side, we have in British Columbia, as you stated, she didn't shut down. We didn't do a full yep. lockdown. Like my yep. fiance is in Scotland. They're on lockdown. Yep. If you're outside and you're not in a work uniform heading to or from work, you get ch chatted to. Yep. So, yep. you know, it, it, here it's completely different. We didn't shut down every aspect of, of a lot of people chose to, especially in retail, to yep. make that decision. And the big box stores, it'll be interesting how they roll things back out. And, and a lot of them are slowly coming back once they were able to put things in play. Um, you know, curbside, web line, whatever, uh, to, in order to do that. But the smaller businesses, some of them have not been able to pivot to the electronic. No, that's right. And, and things like that. So we're, as some, a chamber, some product lines and some businesses just don't lend themselves to that too, you know? Exactly. Really yeah. You know, Jeanette's a perfect example on here. Her product lines, she's out sampling yeah. products, food yeah. mainly in grocery stores. Well, that's the last person, no offense, Jeanette, but nobody wants to walk <laughs> into a grocery store. I love you and you know it. You don't want to walk in there and go, mm, food sampling right now would make people insane. Like it would drive people crazy. Yeah, you're not doing it anymore. Of course you can't. So how do you you still maintain your contracts and things like that so I understand from her perspective and I mean the helps for the me myself and I company right now unfortunately when I'm asking that question of the small entrepreneur and, and the person that's the individual that is their business 
the answer I'm receiving is it's the CE, um, the, the $2,000 a month. Yeah. You qualify for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you have, I actually, yeah. Real estate. Oh, you're, you're, reading you're reading. You're reading. I'm, I'm just checking. Tan Taya just mentioned that real estate is an essential service, but everyone's just looking online and no one's really purchasing. Yeah. Um, and I actually, it's funny because I got caught by a real estate agent looking around. It's one of the house, uh, houses, and I got bombarded, Taya. So I know what you're saying. Um, I did that. Um, yeah, it, it's hard with the pivot. So a lot of people have managed that. Um, we are lucky in BC, but the other thing to be conscious of, I think, is, is, is if we do open some things up, it's going to be for a period of time and it's all going to be in how we manage because if we do well and we get that back, then we can keep going forward. If we do poorly, we go back. And they end up like Hokkaido, Japan, closing down again, right? Yeah. No, in Germany, uh, Angela Merkel was out uh, talking about the potential for shutting down again because they've seen a spike uh, in cases in Germany. Was pretty careful about they, they um, did really well how, yeah. how they reopened. So, uh, you know that this is that's the that's the roll of the dice that um, Bonnie cool. Henry and government have to take, right? Um, you, it is it is one of those a pandemic now. The only reason Mary's going to talk like she knows anything about pandemics is because uh, I happened to be the minister in charge when H1N1 rolled on through. So we did all, we didn't get to the place where we had to take the actions that have been taken now, but we certainly planned um, for all of them. And um, one of the first, the first challenge you hit is that you want to wait as long as possible, as long as safely possible to close things um, because you know it's going to have to close for some time and people are going to have to tolerate that. But then you bump up against, well, what does opening look like? And how do you balance the devastation to, people use the term devastation to the economy, which makes it sound kind of ethereal. But what it means is people not being able to buy food and pay their rent. And, you know, it's, it's every devastation to people, right? People's yeah. income. Um, you balance that against, well, what happens if everything goes sideways? And, you know, it's easy to look at the numbers now and say, well, we've got fewer than 100 people in hospital. We've got fewer than 40, I think, in intensive care. You know, we're good. The problem is, and you've seen this in the poultry outbreak and the mission institution outbreak, is it only takes one error. Yep. One error by one person in a province of four and a half million people to start a spike um, that can then spread like wildfire. They can, they can do things about that. And Bonnie Henry's talked about the contact tracing, et cetera. And if, if they can be confident that they've got all those things in place so that if someone shows up with it, they can swoop in, isolate them, find their contacts, isolate them, and put out the fire. If they're confident they'll be able to put out the fire, um, then that moves you closer to, to opening things up. But as long as there's risk that you could have uh, a spark turn into a flame and turn into a raging brush fire. Um, you know, you're, you're best to keep things shut because as bad as it is now, even worse, if you're dealing with this and your employees aren't just off work, they're in intensive care and some of them are dying. Right. So yeah. it's not pleasant. Any way you look at it. I made the decision last night after the premier's announcement that they were extending the um, state of emergency for two more weeks because everybody's been asking you know when can we go back to the office when and I just said if the state of emergency is being extended for two more weeks we're working from home for two more weeks yeah while and, it's in place and it would be expected I same thing my staff are working from home and we've actually gotten pretty good at it but um, uh, you know it, it would be expected I, I'd be surprised if they didn't say this it'd be expected that if you're in a business you know I'm I shouldn't speak for accountants, but you know, if you're, if you're in a desk job, like an accountant, something where you don't really need to be in person and I get it, don't accountants email me all. I know there's times when you have to have people signing things and all that. I get it. I have accountant friends. They tell me this. Um, but you know, if you're doing a job where you can stay at home, probably the advice, even when things open up is going to be, if you can stay at home to do your work, please do so. Because the fewer people that are out there moving around at the beginning, the better, right? So it'll still be probably um, stay at home if you can. Um, but uh, you know, you, you, there's the balancing act, right? If everybody, if there's suddenly a spike in cases, shutting down again is even harder. Yes. That's, that's the hardest part. There you go. Um, so 
you know, uh, Jeanette asked where the government's looking at best countries models for reopening. Uh, if, from what I've been on a lot of Canadian chamber calls, um, when Minister Jolie the other evening was um, an hour and a half, we as a chamber asked her questions. It was fantastic information for us. Um, and one of the things like she said is really it's going to be provincial in nature. Yep. We're so different in Canada that it's it's a piece by piece. We can't you know, some kept, some areas have had no cases and no nothing, but if you opened them back up and people started moving around and moving in and out, that's going to be a problem. Absolutely. Um, and, and even within know, the province, you need to look oh, yeah. at the we're, you know? we're still getting concerns um, from British Columbia communities that are right on the Alberta border and the yeah. numbers of Albertans that they're seeing crossing into stay in their second homes, um, you know, which is a challenge for Canada. Uh, we've never seen you know, interprovincial border closures. And yes, there are provinces that are doing checks at borders, but the borders aren't exactly closed. We don't do that in Canada. We haven't. It's unconstitutional, by the way. Um, but, you know, that's a worry because they think, well, what happens if there's a spike in cases and you've got a tiny little hospital in Invermere and, you know, with five beds or something, what are you going to do? Um, so you know, those are those are the things that could so quickly turn sideways. And that's what's going to keep uh, Bonnie Henry up at night uh, as they start thinking about how they how they open up, right? That's like uh, the situation in Haida Gwaii. You know, when the gentleman came on and said we have two respirators on the island, I went, yeah. you know what? That's yeah. the facts. That yeah. that that makes sense. So that's where we you know we have to look at little tiny in you know and yeah little tiny but, places one road and one provinces, road. Provinces will be different. I mean, the idea of social distancing, you know, in Saskatchewan is very different than if you're in downtown Vancouver. Right. I, I love Saskatchewan. We go months without not, seeing anybody but our neighbors. Yeah, I mean, anyway. it's, not, it's, not me, it's not me hating on Saskatchewan. I love Saskatchewan. No. Um, but, you know, it, it is a different context for different, different provinces. Oh, totally. Absolutely. You live miles, four miles east and west of your yeah. nearest neighbor. So in well, some we, we started and got to different places at different times. I mean, my goodness, look at Quebec. Yeah. Um, and part of that, you know, some of it is uh, down to having uh, really good uh, planning and actions that were taken. Some of it is just strictly timing and luck. Um, you can almost, you can almost entirely um, put the uh, the challenges of Quebec down to the timing of their spring break versus the timing um, of British Columbia's and when the restrictions started coming in, because there people traveled, came back, um, and whereas here we were already in the mode of, hey, you better be careful if you're if you're coming back, right? Yeah, yeah. So next steps, um, what do you think, and this is hypothetical, Mary's opinion, um, okay. what do you think about federal government? I know we just did a 30 day closure of the border, but our friends down south don't quite to seem have things under control as well as we do, saying it kindly. Um, yeah. And it, there is some concern that people, that they might open the border and in, in that I think we've got 18 days left or something. Yeah. What do you think? I haven't heard directly. Um, we were all pretty thankful that in the end, um, the federal government uh, paid heed uh, to what we were saying in British Columbia. I think I think the, the minister and others uh, made it clear they probably wished Very. that the border was closed sooner. Yeah. Uh, and we know now um, from the uh, the lab research that they've done that our, our initial cases um, were from the US. Um, so, you know, which, it, which is not surprising and it, and, and it doesn't mean that these were like tourists. It's usually our people who travel to the U S come back, they bring it. Right. Yeah. Um, so what will happen with it? I hope, and I'm trusting that, um, the federal government will be talking to, um, those provinces that have a significant amount of contact and cross-border travel ordinarily, um, connecting to a state where they're having trouble. Thankfully for us, Washington has seemed to get more of a handle on their cases. Mm -hmm. But you look back east and what's going on in New York City and yikes. Yeah. And then what happens if um, the US and some states open up in an irresponsible way and see some more spikes? So um, they're going to have to be really careful with that. Um, you know, it's already open to essential travel. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I feel for um, the people who have family across the border or, or people who have 
uh, second homes across the border or sometimes businesses too, right? Um, yeah. Those are all big challenges. So there's yeah. going to be pressure on them to open it up for sure. But that would be probably the, to get that wrong would probably be the single biggest risk for us in terms of getting out of this. If I had a crystal ball, I would bet a guess. I would actually put money on that. It's going to get another 30 day extension. I, yeah. I mean, that's my hunch. Yeah. I need to do. Yeah. But I'm not playing poker. Yeah. <laughs> Not at this point. No, I know. Um, did anybody have any other questions for Mary? If they wanted to throw another question up, please pop it into the chat box and I'd be happy to uh, go through that. Um, yeah, the projections, uh, somebody asked if you to give a projection on opening safely. And again, that's, I think that's so sectoral. And, um, and, and again, we're working, I'm working, the chamber's working with the township of Langley so far. Yeah. We have I, a task force set up to work on sort of how, what does it look like? And we've got sectoral yeah. representation on it to sort of take a look at that. We're looking at it at the provincial level. Um, as a chamber network, we're feeling very um, appreciative of the fact that we've got three representation on the pre premier's uh, task force as well. So that gives us a, like, we're, and we're meeting weekly with the BC Chamber and Val's yeah, that's our good. information and putting it back up to. Yeah, so Val's been great. Val's been yeah. great. Yeah. And as a chamber network, we've been really working together, um, small chambers and big chambers and every community is different. We're all facing different challenges with our, within our business community. Um, I just have to say it. I've been good friends with the CEO of the Port um, Murray Chamber for uh, Oh, month. goodness. And my heart just breaks for them. What do you I even mean, say? What do you even think? I just, I messaged him and said, I know this absolutely makes no sense, but if I can do anything to help you, please message me. Yeah. Even if it's just I, send yeah, you something no. from Vancouver. It yeah. makes us, you know, we're dealing with on, and they on multiple levels are dealing with um, things that are just not man caused, right? I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're things that are happening because nature's um, taking its course what do you say right i mean goodness they're they're sitting waiting for locusts to come next or that dogs was or funny i mean sort of, they've just yeah. been hit so hard and so many multiple times yeah. um you know you 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 talked about opening being uh, sectoral i think that's true but i think um the signals we're hearing from uh, dr henry for example they indicate to me that a, a lot of what you're going to see is going to be based on uh, how each sector plans. Yes, um, yes. You know, she seems to have put out an open invitation for sectors to tell her how they would manage the guidelines. And so it strikes me that those sectors that get in there with a plan that's going to work um, are going to see themselves opened up, yeah. right? And I think and that I know Vancouver has some plans for restaurants with patios and things like that. I mean, that isn't as effective if you want to talk about Langley and other communities where we're not we have some patios but we're not really a patio culture yet but um you know we'll see I, I think the restaurant industry in particular is working very hard to figure out uh, some protocols then you get back to the consumer right what is what does that mean if you're in a restaurant where you know you can only have four people at your table maximum I'm 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 just hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. Same here. But you know, only four people at your table and uh, the servers can't come and touch your plates and things. You have to go and get it from the serving window or, uh, you know, I mean, there's any number of ways you can do it. Is it the same experience? Do you still want to go and have that experience? I mean, let's hope, right? But yeah. 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 Uh, Taya just asked any news on the ferries. I'm assuming you mean taking them off of essential service. I think while the state of emergencies in place. I think everything that's in place right now will remain until they change it up. Am I wrong, Mary? Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I'd be surprised. And, and remember the essential service list that they put out, and I think it, it kind of confused people, right? It made people think, well, if you're not on that list, you're supposed to be closed. Um, they never actually got to that place. They never used the emergency order to close down everything but, but essential services. So all it is right now is a, a list of if, if they did go to closing everything but essential services, then those would be the essential services left open. But that's all it is right now as a list. They never put an order behind it. Um, ferries, they're faced with a challenge that is very similar to what transit's facing, yeah. um, right? They need to maintain a minimum, minimum level of service, but at the same time, 
uh, their ridership has just plummeted. I mean, I think it's down uh, upwards of 90% now, I think was the last number I heard. Uh, even that weekend where people were um, shaming the folks getting on the ferry, uh, it turned out the numbers actually didn't show an increase of people uh, riding. It was actually significantly down. The reason there were all the, the people lined up was because there were so few sailings um, that they were all, you know, piled into one, uh, one or two of them. But I would expect it stays the same, um, you know, unless they can't afford to keep operating, that might be, uh, might be something that impacts it, but they've gone down to pretty much bare bones now. I don't think there's much more they can reduce. Yeah. She, Taylor is living on the Sunshine Coast now. So she's uh, moved over to my old stomping grounds and she's yeah. saying it closed over there. And I can, I can understand that. Yeah. It's such a small tight knit community. If something goes yeah. wrong, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. <laughs> You know? but at the same time, you know, when you get to small communities like that, and I've lived in a few of those too that are very dependent and, you know, they, they will want to maintain a minimum level of service just so that they're there um, for business to take place for emergency purposes, you know, they, they need them there. Yeah. Yeah. I lived up there when there was a ferry strike. It's not pretty. Yeah, it isn't. <laughs> um, Jeanette had asked, how you were do how are you doing? Oh, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of knitting. Uh, why, why you may ask? Well, um, because I was, well, I'm doing conference calls, you know, sometimes six hours a day. And for a lot of those, you need to listen. And sometimes I present. But if you know much about knitting, once you've got the stitches you're working, I mean, you can knit and talk at the same time. And most of mine are not Zoom calls, they're just phone calls. So I've already knitted a full Afghan for my daughter. I'm in the midst of uh, an Irish pattern one. <laughs> I've knitted slippers. If anybody knows Ralph Sultan, the MLA on the North Shore, I knitted him some slippers because he said his feet were cold at night. Um, and yeah, so I've been doing a lot. So that, that's the funny part. Um, awesome. it, it's been a bit tough. My, my dad's in assisted living. And so I call him in the morning and I call him at night, you know, check in because we can't visit and I drop off uh, necessary supplies to him like Guinness um, once in a while. You're a good daughter, Mary. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, that's tough because you have to keep telling him. He's like, oh, you know, when do you think we'll get out? He's getting a little stir crazy now, especially since uh, they're doing dinner in their rooms now. They don't, they don't do their meals communally anymore. They're just bringing yeah. it to the room. So he's sitting in his apartment, right? getting meals dropped off, you know, so it's tough trying to encourage other people, right? And then, you know, there's also just this, this feeling of impotence when, you know, people are calling for help and you have to say, you know, I got nothing for you, right? That's, yeah. that's tough because our whole job, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't become an MLA for the, you know, great travel and, and making everybody love you, that's for sure. Um, you, you know, you do it because you like to help people and like to get things done for them. And when you can't, you know, that's, that's really frustrating. So, but thank you for asking. I mean, I'm doing fine. My daughter's doing fine. The cats have, um, I don't know. I think the cats look at us now and think, I wonder how long till the humans are gone. And we I've seen a few memes on, on everything where the dogs are like, I love my humans. They're home forever. This is great. They love me. And the cats are like, when are you people leaving my house? <laughs> yeah. 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 The, there, I, there was a meme I saw where the cat, the cats thought bubble is get a human. They said they're never home. They said <laughs> my, my daughter, I'll tell you one cat story. My daughter has, um, my daughter has three cats and um, two of them are pretty ordinary do cat things. You know, one of them, uh, she, she has not really warmed up to me, right? Um, since they moved in until recently. Now I'm home all the time at my desk here instead of my desk at the office. Well, so she's decided I actually have a lap that you might want to sit on. Well, she doesn't take no for an answer. And she's one of these cats who will sidle up to you and act all loving. And she wants to be petted. And then when you start to pet her, right, she... <laughs> and attacks you. So there's been some interesting conference calls where she kind of, you know, pushes her way in and then uh, attacks me while I'm trying to type or move my mouse or something. But um, yeah, she's, she's decided I'm okay now, but only in limited quantities, right? <laughs> they pick their humans, they do. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad I adopted from laps prior to, just, just prior to all of this. Um, he gets me out of the house for a walk and keeps me from going insane. So. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Somebody was looking for a puppy the other day. They're hard to find. 
<laughs> they are well as soon as the as soon as the shelters put out the word early on that they were having trouble with a backlog of pets boom everybody yeah. adopted i'm hearing that from a number of people there's just none none to be had yeah. there's there are still some rescues out there but a lot of them come through the u.s border and right now they can't get them through so because they're yeah. not an essential it's not essential so unfortunately um but does anybody have anything else i'd like to cover off with if not i'm sure mary wouldn't mind an extra 15 minutes in her calendar <laughs> to check Yay! things I'm, <laughs> i know <laughs> exactly um thank you very much i'm i'm i will be in touch in the next few weeks just to touch base with you sure. and see where we're at if anything changes well, and, anything. and seriously anytime i'm you know i'm happy yeah. happy to to do this anytime you want great that's great thank you very much mary from all of us and thank you to everybody for hanging out and and good luck to everybody Good yeah. luck to everybody. I know this is really, yeah. really tough. And if there is anything our office can do, please don't hesitate to call. Gabrielle and Fiona are, you know, they've got their laptops up and running at home and, and we're trying to keep track as best we can of all the different, you know, government programs, et cetera. So if you have a question about something that gets announced or, you know, need to figure something out, just please give us a call. And I've given the ladies the tools of our website's got everything updated daily as it's announced oh. as well in all the links. Oh. I should say, and now I don't remember where I put the paper down, but I can get the information to you, Colleen. Um, Andrew, our leader, is doing a topic focused on small business. And I yeah. don't know where I put the paper with the info on it, but- um, hey, Your team sent it to me and I'm gonna send right. it up to our members. Yeah, so, so just, I would just encourage everybody to take part in that because a big part of it is, you know, we're, we're trying to take in as much information as we can um, so that when government starts rolling out, you know, recovery plans, all that, uh, we know what it is we need to communicate on behalf of small business. So, uh, please take part if you have the time to do so. I will do that. And I will also forward you the updated, um, survey results because we're oh, also perfect. getting specific glances at Langley. So great. I will update and we can even do an update before all of that comes through and give you an overview. No, oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank Alrighty. you. Very much. Thanks to everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.